Okay, so let me start uh, at the beginning to talk about what is MobileCoin, uh, what is MobileCoin's approach to payments, what is Signal Messenger, and what is MobileCoin Fog. These are sort of uh, background to understand what our technology is. So everybody knows what the payments industry is. It's large and ex it's experiencing rapid change. Uh, many payment systems are very complex. They have lots of intermediaries and fees, and they end up tied to specific nations and banking regions. Uh, remittances are treated as an industry of their own with even more significant fees. Uh, in China, we've seen major change in the payments industry because uh, new technologies like Alipay have displaced traditional card payments. Almost everybody uses mobile phones and QR codes for payments in a, a number of industries, in a number of countries in Asia now. Uh, in the US, credit card payments remain dominant as the mode of payments for, for most day-to-day -day purchases that people make. Uh, fees are quite significant for small businesses and there are burdens of maintaining and securing transaction data. Uh, credit agencies are frequently hacked more than we would like and this can result in harm to consumers. Um, consumers have started using apps like Cash App and Venmo in various niches, and they've gained attraction among different groups as the payment industry has, has continued to try to innovate. Um, MobileCoin is a blockchain-based payment trail with best-in-class UX and privacy on mobile devices. The idea is that it's supposed to be borderless, private, and non-custodial by design. You can send payments from your phone for a quarter of a penny, uh, they're final on chain in five seconds, and no one can see the sender, recipient, or amount. So it's supposed to be an alternative approach to payments based on digital cash. Um, Signal Messenger is a popular uh, encrypted messaging app. It's an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging app that was created by Moxie Marlinspike in 2014. Uh, Moxie Marlinspike is a well-known cryptographer and privacy advocate. Signal is designed to offer maximum privacy and collect as little data about their users as possible. At the same time, Signal has a very nice UX, and it does not expose the users to details of keys and encryption. Even though all the messages between the users are being end-to-end -end encrypted, um, the users don't have to think about their public keys and, and manually exchange public keys to make this happen. The app infrastructure makes this all happen under the hood in a way that a lot of people have found very appealing. Um, I'm trying to get to the next slide. MobileCoin and Signal Messenger uh, have sort of, we, we, we have formed a, a partnership. MobileCoin was founded with the goal of creating a technology good enough to be integrated into Signal to meet their high standards for privacy. Uh, and the, the idea here is that the same infrastructure that helps people manage encryption keys and exchange public keys can also help people manage cryptocurrency keys and exchange cryptocurrency addresses without having to actually type long strings of characters and so on. We believe that this is a route to the best UX in crypto and it can be leveraged into a, a peer to peer payment network. Um, and so the mobile coin network was launched in December of 2020. Uh, so that was almost three years ago. Um, Signal launched a payments beta shortly after in February, 2021. And the basis of this integration is a technology that we created called mobile coin fog. Mobile coin fog is a collection of oblivious services using Intel SGX in several novel ways. And that's gonna be the focus of the rest of the talk. Um, at a high level, like very, at a, at a sort of a very bird's eye view, the idea is that Fog post processes the, bot, the blockchain. So phones make requests to Fog to figure out what's going on in the blockchain without compromising their privacy. And then they submit transactions to the consensus network. The consensus network settles blocks that contains transactions. And then Fog eventually gets those blocks and, and post processes them. Uh, so in, in this, that's sort of the introduction to what we're trying to do. In the first part of this, I want to try to talk about private information retrieval and why this is super interesting and relevant to us. Um, so a core concept for this, for, for, for blockchain is um, U, the, the UTXO model. Many blockchains are based on Bitcoin's model, which is that the blockchain is an immutable append only ledger of transactions. Um, an, an industry term is that a transaction output is a credit within the system conceptually. It's a piece of data that gets committed to the blockchain that has a value and an address associated to it. The address is like a public key in, in uh, asymmetric cryptography. When you receive a payment, a new unspent TXO, also called a UTXO, appears in the blockchain address to you. So you could imagine there's actually some blob in the blockchain that has your address on it and it has some value in whatever the cryptocurrency of this chain is. Or if it supports multiple chains, there'll be like a token ID or something also. Um, so to integrate this into mobile apps, there's a bunch of changes that have to happen because blockchains are not sort of 
designed, most blockchains like Bitcoin are not really designed to work for mobile. So mobile apps talk to servers. They don't talk peer to peer. They're, you generally don't run peer to peer networks on mobile apps where they are all trying to talk to each other. There are a lot of good reasons for that. Uh, mobile apps frequently lose connectivity. A functional payment system should not assume that the recipient is online at the moment they need to be paid. They might be unreachable for any number of reasons. Um, mobile apps also cannot consume bandwidth or CPU constantly. Mobile, mobile OSs will shut down your app if you're constantly doing background activity and the user is not looking at the app. Um, so you, ha you have to have a way to, to not do that, even though many blockchains, uh, like a full node will continuously do both of these things. Um, so this sort of leads us to the idea of oblivious message delivery. So the goal we have to have for this technology to work is that when one signal user pays another, signal should not be able to infer who paid who, even if they actively attack their own infrastructure. That's part of their whole privacy goal. They want it to be impossible to infer uh, the important sensitive activities of the users. Uh, they, 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 they need that for both their branding, their regulatory posture, and all kinds of things. Um, due to bandwidth and CPU limits, not all users can download all UTXOs. Most blockchains work with the idea that all participants are downloading the entire chain if you're running a full node. But for this to work on mobile, each user should only download their own UTXOs. Um, so this leads us to sort of a conundrum. When Alice pays Bob, the infrastructure must obliviously deliver the UTXO to Bob without the service operator seeing this or learning this that it, that it is Bob's UTXO. That's something that most normal web infrastructure cannot do. It's a, if, if I'm the operator and I have root on a normal server, I can see what data you downloaded. And so you have to rethink a lot of fundamental things if you want to try to solve this problem. So this, this brings us to a topic that's traditionally been an academic topic called private information retrieval. Uh, in, the, in PIR, which is sort of a problem statement, the idea is that you have a client and you have a server which has a large data set. The client would like to search that data set for a particular key, but they don't want the service operator to learn what they're searching for. And private information retrieval is like a trustless cryptographic protocol for this task. Um, and in, in terms of like philosophy of Web3, I, I want to try to connect this to philosophy of Web3 because I think, it, I think it's important uh, to sort of motivate the work. Web3 means a lot of different things to different people. It's, it's really a social movement. No one owns the definition of Web3. But most people agree uh, when we talk about Web3 that Web2 is now largely associated with giants like Facebook and Google that own large parts of the internet and harvest all the data for their profit. This is a, a business model called surveillance capitalism. Uh, many people in the Web3 community say that Web3 means that you own your own data. It doesn't belong to giant internet uh, companies. I believe that you cannot meaningfully own your own data if you do not have privacy around that data. Um, so let's talk about some examples of private information retrieval in practice. 10 years ago, Signal Messenger ran up a very, against a very difficult private information retrieval problem. Users need to be able to discover if their contacts are using Signal and get their public keys to send messages to them. However, Signal does not want to learn your contact list. They don't want to be able to see or infer what phone numbers you're querying. They don't want to harvest the entire social network of all of the people that are using Signal. They don't want to be able to see that or be able to be forced by someone to like investigate that. Um, so they, they thought about this for a while and it turns out that obvious approaches like hashing phone numbers don't actually accomplish anything because the space of phone numbers is too small. And from the point of view of a cryptographer, you're gonna be able to brute force whatever hash this is. Um, they wrote a blog post about this in 2014 and then they researched it for about three years. Um, now I'm gonna to try to talk about private information retrieval research. Most academic papers on private information retrieval fall into the category of either computational PIR or information theoretic PIR. And uh, these are both like not very suitable solutions, unfortunately. In computationally PIR, generally to handle a query, the server has to load every data item into memory and then do public key cryptography with it just to handle one query. And this unfortunately just doesn't scale. Uh, in information theoretic PIR, there's not one server, but there's K servers, which are assumed to be non-communicating. These methods are a lot faster but the threat model doesn't really make a lot of sense in practice. There's no way to verify that the servers are not colluding. And when you have to trust people, but you have no way to verify that they're not spying on you, uh, that's, that's a very weak threat model. And so I generally, these, these computational PIR and information theoretic PIR fields uh, just haven't produced uh, techniques that have been useful in practice. 
So Signal created a new approach to this. They created a service called Signal Contact Discovery. They decided that the best way to approach this problem was to create an Intel SGX enclave. So that's a trusted hardware solution. The idea is roughly that the data set of phone number, the mapping of phone numbers to public keys is stored in the enclave's encrypted memory, and the signal service operators cannot see it. When users connect to the service, they create a secure connection to the enclave using remote attestation. The enclave scans across the entire data set in constant time in order to resolve queries, but many queries are batched together in order to amortize the cost. And this doesn't require public key operations per data item, right? It's running at native speeds inside of SGX. Um, finally, the recrypted responses are returned after some time delay to all the users. Uh, and it's worth noting, like, this uses the full power of the Intel SGX security model. They need to have confidentiality. They need to have memory integrity or else there are active attacks. Uh, and they need to have remote attestation or it doesn't uh, build, turn into a, a protocol that users can trust in. Remote attestation allows users to trust and verify. Um, so to my knowledge, this is the first private information retrieval service that was deployed to millions of users in real life. Signal was not content just to promise, we won't log your data. They want to use cryptography. They want to use these new security techniques to prove that they are technically incapable of harvesting your data and eliminate the need for blind trust. So I believe that this is a social norm worth building towards to counter surveillance capitalism. Um, so the signal content discovery was really great, but the algorithm they actually use is pretty rudimentary. They still required touching every data item in order to support a query. And so it's not appropriate for a low latency service. And that was fine for their use case because they, they decided they didn't actually need signal content discovery to be low latency. They were okay if it takes five minutes to find your contacts because you don't add contacts all that often. Um, but we needed to build a low latency service to support payment completion. So we started looking around for better, for improvements that we could make. So and that brought us to Oblivious RAM. So Oblivious RAM is a data structure with a cryptographic security property. It does not require touching all the data to serve a request. Instead, data is continuously shuffled over time in a way that provably obscures the flow of data. Together with the secure enclave approach, it can be used to build a low latency private information retrieval service in practice. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the history. So Oblivious RAM was invented by Odette Goldreich in 1987. There was a major breakthrough called Path ORAM, which was due to Emil Stefanov, Elaine Shee, and many others, which was the first one with good theoretical worst case performance. And Zero Trace was a really important paper in 2017 of Sassy, uh, Fletcher, and Gorbanov, which implemented Path ORAM in Intel SGX enclaves. This was the first one that had promising performance measurements on real hardware. Um, this is where MobileCoin sort of touches the, the story. So MobileCoin launched an oblivious service called MobileCoin Fog in February 2021 to support mobile clients like Signal and Mobi in a privacy-preserving manner. We load the entire MobileCoin blockchain into ORAM, and this supports all the mobile users balance checks in real time. This is the first time that ORAM technology was shipped in production to millions of users. Uh, and we built on the ideas of ZeroTrace and implemented a number of performance optimizations and algorithm uh, parameterization choices and such. We did a lot of research to make it practical with only a few actual machines. We were actually able to serve on the order of 100 oblivious requests per second with one machine. Um, so that's that's the first part, private information retrieval and, and the, the importance of uh, secure enclave technology for that. The second part I want to talk, to talk about to try to really understand FOG is stealth addresses. Uh, so in, in, in the topic of stealth addresses, I'm going to try to talk about privacy blockchains, what are stealth addresses? Um, I want to talk about the sort of the scalability challenges associated with this. I want to talk about our solution, which is something we call sequential stealth addresses. And I want to try to give an overview of the implementation and the architecture. Um, so the, the first idea to understand is pseudonymous versus anonymous. So blockchains like Bitcoin are called pseudonymous. That's because all of your activity is associated to your address. Even if I, so, so, so it means that like, if I make a payment at the grocery store, the grocery store can suddenly see all of my other payments. So the grocery store can like infer my rent, which is like very strange and not something you really want in a payment system. Uh, and not, not how things like this work today. So you can try to work around this, right? You could try to say, I'm gonna use a new address systematically for each received payment, but there's still traceability when you actually move the money out of those different addresses. Um, and in practice, actually negotiating new addresses all the time with all the people who need to pay you just requires too much coordination. Like it's not actually feasible to use Bitcoin this way. So there have been a number of subsequent blockchains that, that 
that are privacy focused and really seek to be truly anonymous. What that means is that your UTXO should not be linked on chain to your address and your activity should not be linkable either. So that um, e each, act each action that you take is, is, is uh, from the point of view of someone analyzing the blockchain, they have no reason to think that, that, that you created both of these things. These, it's, uh, you, you can define it in terms of an indistinguishability criteria, but I, I won't get into that here. Um, so let's try to talk about what stealth addresses are. Stealth addresses are, are sort of a, a solution to try to address that problem. In a stealth address system, when you receive a payment, the address which actually appears on chain is randomized in a special way. So there might be a whole bunch of addresses. Um, and, and typically in these kinds of chains, the values are also obscured. So all of these addresses have been, have been noised in a very special way uh, based on elliptic curve cryptography typically. Um, then, so, th so th that raises the question, how do I actually find my payments? And so the idea for, th for these kinds of privacy chains is that in, in order to find my actual payments, I have to use my view private key. So there's a process called view key matching where you can take your view private key and match it against an arbitrary UTXO. And then if it's yours, you'll be able to figure out that it belongs to you and you'll be able to figure out what the value is. And then you can later use your spend key to go on and spend it. Uh, so you can only identify your own transactions this way and no one else who doesn't have your view private key is able to identify your transactions in this manner. So that's great and it fixes the privacy problems on chain, but it creates massive scalability problems for mobile devices, right? So suppose I'm on a mobile device. Once we have stealth addresses, there's no way for me to ask a server for just my UTXO since it can't identify them. Uh, it has no idea which, one, which UTXOs are mine. If it just gives me all the UTXOs and I have to download and scan all the UTXOs on my phone doing like trial decryption. And unfortunately, that's just not feasible. If I give away my view key to the, to the server, then I'm defeating the privacy of the system. So you might think, what if I give away my view key to an enclave on the server side and the enclave scans on my behalf? And unfortunately, that still is prohibitively bad because it means that you need to do O of N work server side per transaction if you have N users. Um, and it just means that as you have more and more users, you're gonna have to rapidly scale up the number of servers uh, growing in a linear manner with the number of users. Like, like it, it, and if the blockchain is moving fast enough, you may need like a server per user, which is just too expensive. Um, so the, the, the core issue is that suppose you have N daily active users, let's say. The number of transactions per day is O of N and the view key scanning for everyone requires N times as much work since there are N different view keys. So these sort of, these naive sort of stealth address approaches create order N squared work, which is just too much. And without an algorithm change, all you can really do is shuffle it around. You can try to push work to the clients. You can try to move work to the servers. But if you need to do order n squared work, you're just not going to be able to scale to, a, to the, the number of people where you would have an impact on the world. Uh, and so we invented sequential stealth addresses as a variation of stealth addresses in order to fix this. Um, so let me try to explain the idea of sequential stealth addresses. So the idea is that Bob's payments should be assigned to stealth addresses which follow a pseudo-random sequence for privacy. And this is predictable only by Bob and a special enclave, which, which helps make the system work. So if Bob's payments are assigned to these predictable stealth addresses, then Bob can make a very simple PIR query to find his next payment by just following the sequence. And what that means is that, that Assuming we have sequential stealth addresses, Bob doesn't have to download every payment. He doesn't have to do trial decryption. Um, at the same time, if they're pseudo-random to everyone else, it's okay to reveal them. It's okay to have them in the infrastructure or on the blockchain or something. Um, so the, the, however, there's, there's a, a pro clear problem with this. So if Alice pays Bob, but Bob's sequence is not predictable by Alice, then how can Alice construct the transaction? How can Alice attach the stealth address to the payment they're sending to Bob as they have no way of computing what the next one is supposed to be. And the solution that, that we came up with is to do a two-phase process. So the idea is that this is all mediated by the special enclave. Alice encrypts a message for the special enclave and attaches it to the TXO. That enclave post-processes the blockchain computing appropriate sequential stealth addresses for each TXO. And it only has to do O of one work per TXO, even if there's a lot of users. Um, the service which implements this is called Fog Ingest. It has three pieces of state. It has an ingest privacy key, an ingress private key, which is the key that, you, that it's decrypting data against. Uh, it has a, a, an ingress private key used for creating the, um, the sequential stealth addresses. And it has an oblivious hash table mapping public keys to counter values. 
Um, I'm going to try. To, I'm going to try to to sort of go through sort of the high level architecture pretty quickly. So the, the UTXO pipeline looks roughly like this. There's a consensus network here in the upper left, which is accepting transactions, validating them, and emitting blocks. And then there's this fog ingest server that's post processing the blockchain. It's taking uh, the, the set of all blocks that were emitted in all these TXOs, and it's trying to decrypt these messages to it to tell it who users are supposed to go that only this enclave can read. Um, and then it is computing the sequential stealth addresses, attaching them to the TXOs again, and then it's actually just storing them in a SQL database. This is like a secondary service that uh, mobile users uh, opt into in order to avoid scanning the whole blockchain. So then the SQL database contains TXOs tagged with these unpredictable stealth, ad stealth addresses. Uh, and then finally, this, this database is hoovered up into Fog View Service, which is uh, storing, serving all of that data obliviously to the users. So the way, the way it works is there's two phones, let's say. So, so if Alice wants to send a payment to Bob, Alice will fetch an IAS report from the SQL database, which was published by Fog Ingest. When Fog Ingest decided what its ingress private key was, it spits out the public key and signs it using the Intel remote attestation, um, uh, using, using the verification report. And this report uh, get, goes into the database, and Alice is able to fetch the latest one. and can then verify the IAS report to ensure that it really came from an enclave that would not have given it to anybody else. And then it's safe for Alice to encrypt the fact that this payment needs to go to Bob uh, in a way that only this enclave can read and then attach it to the TXO. Then Alice is able to build a transaction and submit it to the consensus network. Um, then the, the pipeline happens, the block goes to ingest, it goes to SQL, it goes to fog view. Bob first checks his fog view for egress keys. Uh, Bob is able to pair these egress keys with his view private key to himself reconstruct the, the pseudo random sequence that his payments are coming along. Then he can make repeated PIR queries against the data set in order to find his payments. Um, and what's really cool about this process is that when Bob performs a balance check, if he got one payment or if he got zero payments, those two situations look completely indistinguishable from the point of view of the pipeline. Um, Fog view is a totally constant time oblivious RAM implementation. And it's able to uh, always serve back the same number of encrypted bytes to Bob, no matter what, whether his request was a hit or a miss. That is, that is essentially the security property that we're shooting for here. Uh, so I designed and prototyped FOG, and uh, we implemented our ORAM in 2019. A large team has worked together, too many people for me to shout out now to productionize and scale this into the future. Uh, but I'm extremely proud of the work that we did here. Um, so. I, I want to say a few words before I run out of time, but um, the 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 main thing I want to I want to address is are TEs here to stay? So TEs are um, sort of a, a nascent technology that has not seen widespread adoption, but there's a lot of interest in the industry, and um, there's a lot of people who are who are looking at this area to try to understand where things are headed. I believe the TEs are here to stay. I believe that despite advances in homomorphic encryption we're still really far from building a practical PIR service this way. Um, I believe that homomorphic encryption and MPC, while they're, they're really interesting and promising technologies, they also can create thorny or intractable key distribution problems, which may make it really hard to have one server serving oblivious requests to millions of users. Um, and if, if you can't do that, then you, you have major scalability problems. Um, and the TE approach essentially avoids this issue because users don't have to share the homomorphic encryption key, they just have to attest to this one enclave, which they can do without having a, having a secret key that supports the homomorphic encryption. Um, so despite different people's concerns about trusted hardware assumptions, uh, trusted enclave technologies, they seem to enable applications that don't really seem to be possible without it with a pure cryptography approach. Like, I don't see any way that you can do sequential stealth addresses with pure homomorphic encryption or pure MBC without really changing the threat model. Like. You could try to do something like this with MPC, but then uh, if a, a minority uh, or if a majority of the MPC participants are dishonest, then they can spy on all the users. Um, and with the trusted enclave technologies, the, the threat model is different. If you assume, if you're willing to assume things like like that SGX is secure, that you don't have these small cabals of people that need to be honest. Um, and these kinds of technologies can create a really meaningful UX benefit. Um, so given the level of research interest and successes, I think that more people will try to build cloud services that you can't see through. And so I, I think that trusted enclave technologies have a, a bright future. 
that's uh, that's all I hope to say. And I'm, I have barely any more time, but uh, thank you.